As they passed this, the, perhaps the funniest uh, statement of the trial came from school board member Heather Giese, who said, oh, we're not going to be sued. I have confidence in the district's lawyers. Problem with this was the district's lawyer had told them, you're going to get sued and you're going to lose. Had told them, do not pass this. And that statement became rather prophetic. Not only did they get sued, because they had ignored their own attorney's advice, their insurance policy was canceled. So all of the money that they ended up having to pay out for the plaintiff's fees in this case, they had to pay themselves. Their liability policy wouldn't cover it. So pretty expensive mistake all the way around. Why do I keep ending up with that? Because I keep touching stuff. Uh, let's see, now where was I? Ah. As I said, bo both sides here are searching for this test case, and, and clearly, as the, we go through the media reports on what was going on during here, clearly it, the facts are on our side in this case. Discovery Institute was pretty unhappy about it. They tried to talk the school board into withdrawing the policy because they knew if we go to court with this one and we lose, it's devastating for our whole legal strategy here. Unfortunately, the Thomas More Law Center was really gung-ho for this, and they talked to the school board and said, look, we'll defend you for free. You know, so don't back down. You're standing up to the devil himself, so, you know, keep going. So uh, they did keep the policy. They ended up um, going to court with it, of course. Um, on the other hand, we felt pretty confident because uh, the facts were pretty clearly on our side. Uh, the National Center for Science Education, which is a national organization that fights to protect science education from the attacks of creationism, immediately began working with the ACLU. They recruited 11 plaintiffs total uh, from the Dover community who would put their name on the lawsuit, including the two former school board members, Carol and Jeff Brown. And then they had to find a law firm to handle the case. Most people don't realize that the ACLU doesn't usually handle their large cases themselves with attorneys who are on staff and paid by them. What they do is they seek out large law firms who will do the case pro bono. Um, and so in this case, Jeannie Scott, who was the director of the National Center for Science Education, sent out an email to a bunch of attorneys who had worked with them over the years, hoping that one of them might know a law firm that would handle the case. And Eric Rothschild, uh, who was a partner with a firm called Pepper Hamilton in Philadelphia, a very large firm of about 400 attorneys, about an hour after she sent this email, he sent one back and said, we'll take it. And then he added, I've been waiting for this for 15 years. And this would prove very fortuitous. The level of commitment shown by Pepper Hamilton in this case was absolutely staggering. Normally what happens with a, I'm sorry, I had a picture of, uh, there's Eric, holding up a copy of, of Pandas and People at the first press conference. Um, ordinarily with cases, with, with firms that do pro bono work like this, it, they do it because it helps their public image and, and it gets experience for their young associates. People just out of law school, they don't have a big client list, hand them cases like this, they can cut their teeth, learn their way around a courtroom, and so forth. Not this case. Pepper Hamilton assigned three full partners in their firm, plus two associates, plus several paralegals, plus receptionists, administrators, technical people. I mean, they threw the book at this thing. Uh, and it turned out very good. Uh, there was also then Richard Katsky of America's United for Separation of Church and State and Vic Walchek, uh, who was the legal director for the ACLU of Pennsylvania. And this was really a legal dream team. What the OJ defense team was for criminal law, this was for civil law. Uh, and it, when this trial started, it quickly became obvious that the, the disparity in legal talent was, was really huge. The next task then was to recruit a group of expert witnesses to testify against the policy. And these are the ones they got. Ken Miller, who was the author of the textbook that they used, uh, and a Brown University biologist. Barbara Forrest, uh, who was a philosopher. Kevin Padian, who was a paleontologist. Brian Alters in education. Jack Haught in theology. Oops. And Robert Pennock. Uh, it says Michigan. It's actually Michigan State. Uh, Rob is the president and, co and our co-founder of Michigan Citizens for Science. And he was an expert witness in this case as well, as a philosopher of science. We'll call these the good guys. Uh, the ID side was also <laughs> show my bias. The ID side was also putting together a, a cast of experts, uh, and here are the three primary ones: Michael Behe uh, from Lehigh University, Scott Minnick of the University of Idaho, and Steve Fuller, who looks a little bit like Billy Bob Thornton if he was anorexic, uh, from the University of Warwick in um, in England. And we'll call them the bad guys, if you don't mind. They had five other experts lined up actually, and. Uh, they all withdrew. Three of them in June of 2005, a few months before the trial, all, within three days of each other, all Discovery Institute fellows all withdrew from the case and offered conflicting explanations as to why. 
Uh, we've had some, we've speculated on why we think that is, but we've gotten a whole bunch of different uh, explanations. Uh, two more of their witnesses actually withdrew during the trial when they were scheduled to testify. Uh, they were supposed to be there on a Thursday. There was discussion in court. Yes, they're in town. Yes, they're at the hotel. They'll be here on Thursday morning, and they never showed up. And we have no idea. I've contacted both of them to get a comment on it. Never got a response. Uh, so we don't know why they uh, ended up withdrawing. Um, so now we've got the legal team. We've got the team of expert witnesses. Uh, one more group of people that were vital to the outcome of the case was the National Center for Science Education. They acted as consultants in the case. You know, attorneys aren't educated in science, most of them. And so... Uh, we really had to teach the attorneys the science of evolution and the science of intelligent design so that they knew what they were talking about when they, when they got on the witness stand. Um, three people from the National Center for Science Education in particular who were important in the case. Um, on the left here, uh, on the right side of the left picture, is uh, Wesley Ellsbury, who is actually here. Stand up, Wes. Um, <clears throat> Wes is now on leave from the NCSC and, and uh, at Michigan State doing a research project. Um, so they've loaned him to us for a while. Uh, Wes wrote a program, a text matching program, that ended up being really important to the case, and we'll get to that a little bit later. On the right here, Jeannie Scott and Nick Matsky. Jeannie Scott's the director of the National Center for Science Education. Nick Matsky was sort of the point man. He was the one that worked directly with the lawyers in the case, and he just did a tremendous job. Uh, a lot of the key moments in the case came because of his knowledge of the history of the intelligent design movement. And he, you know, he was just on the ball and on top of everything. Um, once the whole team was put together, now the process of discovery has to begin. And that's the pretrial phase when the two sides issue subpoenas, do research, gather information, try to build their case. And this is where the case takes a real turn. Most legal cases in the real world don't look like what you see on TV. And you don't get Perry Mason moments in real world trials. You know, you don't get the, you know, witness on the stand breaking down and under the you know, relentless questioning of the attorney. You don't get the people yelling Eureka when they find a smoking gun. Both of those things actually happened in this case, uh, which is part of the reason why Paramount's looking to make a movie about it. There really is a dramatic arc to what happened. Uh, and the smoking gun moment was in July of 2005. Uh, the NCSC's archivist at the time, uh, Jessica Moran, was searching through their material that they had there in their archives to find anything she could about the book of Pandas and People. And she came across a prospectus that was sent out by the people who owned the book, the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, or FTE, that they sent out to publishing houses uh, to convince them to publish an early version of the book. That document referred to it as a creationist textbook, not an intelligent design textbook. They also had several fundraising letters that referred to creation, not intelligent design. She gave those documents to Nick Matsky, and that started him to thinking. If there's earlier versions of this book, they might be much more explicitly creationist. Because the book was published in the fall of 1987. I remember from earlier, 1987 is when Edwards versus Aguillard came down, banning the teaching of creation science in public schools. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, 89 was, yeah, the, the final version of it that we have, the final manuscript was from late 87. 89 is when the book was actually finally published. Um, so... He thought that if there were manuscripts that existed before that June 1987 ruling, they might talk about creationism a lot more, and this would help prove our case. So he brought that up to Eric Rothschild, who promptly submitted, and there's the actual email that he sent to him, saying, uh, I think we might have something here. So Rothschild uh, subpoenas the book, and uh, John Buell, who was the director of the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, said, I'll go to jail before I'll give them any material at all. Well, when a judge said, you either follow the subpoena or you go to jail, all of a sudden. In early 2005, a package arrives at the NCASC office, which would blow this case wide open. There were not one or two manuscripts of the book. There were five complete manuscripts of the book from as early as 1983. These are the versions. 1983, it was called Creation Biology. 1986, Biology and Creations. 1987, early 87, Biology and Origins. And then there were two manuscripts under the final name, one written in early 1987, one written in late 1987. 